Et je vais maintenant passer en anglais. I'm going to, to turn in English to, uh, to present. I already present you uh, Mark Rottenberg, and uh, we're very lucky to have you in Paris today. Uh, after the European, uh, I won't say centric view of life, but I would say the angle of view for Europe and for France, that would be absolutely uh, amazing to hear from you and uh, the American uh, angle of view. Um, the, 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 what, what we really would be interested um, to better understand as we talk about it is um, what about this new executive order? Do you, do you believe, uh, as it was presented to Bruno earlier, that this is uh, now a sort of a good level of adequacy? And uh, also, uh, Florence touched based on the provision 702. Um, and that I, would, I would really like to hear you uh, commenting on the, this new, this not new provision, this provision that should be renewed very soon. Um, so, um, can you uh, give us more detail and also your you, you thinking about that? And uh, and also, as you are an expert on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I can't resist to ask you if there is any link with this and how artificial intelligence might uh, be uh, impacted by uh, this new framework agreement. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you today, and thank you also uh, for allowing me to speak in English. Um, I don't speak uh, French, and, and people who disagree with me will say I don't speak English very well either. So um, I'm glad to be here with you. Um, and it's also very nice to be here in the French uh, Senate building because the first job I had after law school was working in the United States Senate, and we had just created a new committee specifically on technology and law. And one of our tasks was to update the federal uh, wiretap law to take account of new technologies like the uh, internet and email. So this is a um, very familiar uh, topic uh, for me. And before I get to the very good questions uh, you've asked, I thought I would begin by filling in just a little bit of uh, privacy history from the US perspective. So you'll get some sense of the approach that the United States uh, takes when it thinks about uh, access to electronic communications. And I want to begin with my favorite US uh, privacy case. I've taught at uh, Georgetown for many years, and I always teach this case. It's now almost 100 years old. And it's about a man uh, named Ray Olmsted, who was selling alcohol illegally in the state of Washington in the 1920s. Now, apparently, uh, Mr. Olmsted was very well regarded because, of course, people wanted their whiskey. And uh, he brought in good whiskey from Canada, so they liked him for the whiskey. And he was even very kind to the police officers who were supposed to investigate him. Apparently, he would leave bottles of his whiskey by the police officers' automobiles at night because he was sympathetic to them because they were conducting this investigation. Well, they did, of course, investigate Mr. Olmsted because he was violating a federal law that prohibited the sale of alcohol in the United States in the 1920s. And the way they investigated him was by intercepting the telephone communications he would have with his uh, lieutenants. And of course, this was in the era of copper wires, and they would attach their own wires to the wires of the communications. And over the period of several weeks, by writing down what they heard during the telephone calls, uh, they had several hundred pages of evidence. And they went into court with the purpose of convicting Mr. Olmsted of the crime he had committed with this uh, transcription of the, of the communication. And the question that arose was whether the police were required to obtain a warrant, judicial authority, before they began the investigation. This case goes to the US Supreme Court. And a narrowly divided Supreme Court in 1928 says that there's no warrant required because these communications flow in the air as, as you might imagine a telephone communication. There's a famous dissent uh, by Justice Brandeis who says when we think about the surveillance of this new electronic space, and he could have 
as easily said, digital space, we have to recognize that this search is unbounded in space and time. That if we seize a person's uh, envelope, for example, with a written communication, which the court said would require a warrant, this would be protected by law. And he said, so we should also protect telephone communications. So it takes 40 years, and the Supreme Court in 1967 revisits this issue involving another famous criminal, a man named Katz, who was in a telephone booth uh, recording um, uh, il illegal gambling uh, and being overheard by a tape recorder. And the Supreme Court says, this time now you need a warrant because we agree with what uh, Justice Brandeis had said 40 years ago. Now this is a very important decision. It's a monumental decision in US privacy law because it establishes the warrant requirement as a general matter for electronic communications. And the next year the US passes this very comprehensive privacy law, maybe one of the best privacy laws in the world. But things get complicated because now of course we have to consider electronic surveillance that's done for national security purposes where the primary goal of course is not simply the criminal investigation but obtaining information that literally threatens the state. And so a few years later, the Congress passes a law called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And what this does is it says, in matters involving national security, where you're trying to get access to foreign intelligence information, we're not gonna have all these burdensome requirements. There'll be some judicial review, but it'll be very light review. And as a consequence, there is now an opportunity to use in the narrow national security context, this FISA authority without so much uh, oversight because it's largely secretive and without so much accountability because the judges don't know as much. Fast forward to September 11th and the attack on the United States. And now of course, national security interests have become paramount. And we pass uh, the Patriot Act, which broadly expands the uh, use of uh, surveillance authorities for matters involving uh, foreign intelligence. And many of us in the civil liberties community uh, had opposed this. We thought this was a big mistake, but okay, so it happens. And the members of Congress say, you know, we believe this is necessary to create these new legal authorities. But now there's an interesting twist in the history because Congress believed that it had created certain authorities for national security surveillance. Unbeknownst to the Congress, President Bush, using his own authorities, had told the intelligence agencies, you may also conduct surveillance, which the Congress wasn't aware of. Even the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review, this super secret court with a great deal of authority for secretive surveillance, wasn't aware of this presidential authority. And when it became public, Congress said, wait, hold it. We are not going to allow the president to create this broad surveillance authority without an act of Congress. Now I'm sharing this history and I think it will be of interest to Florence and others here because where section 702 comes from, which is now being hotly debated in the United States Congress, is actually by Congress's effort to reestablish legal authority for surveillance that's done for national security purposes, to create the legal basis. And it is, frankly, targeted at non-US persons outside the United States. Because in that strong tradition that I described to you at the outset, in our surveillance within the country, primarily for criminal investigation, we have a high warrant uh, requirement. But 702 created a low warrant requirement, quite low. All right, so let's go forward. Oh, and by the way, I actually testified in the Congress in 2012 when they were planning to extend the Section 702 authority, and I made a whole series of recommendations. I was actually on a committee 
for the American Bar Association. And so we established new reporting requirements. And we said, if you are going to use such broad surveillance authority, there should be more public accountability. So at least we know, is this an effective surveillance technique? Is it being used properly? Is it, is it being abused? And some of our recommendations were actually incorporated in the amendments to the FISA uh, uh, Amendment Act in, in 2012. So this was good. And then Max Schrems comes along. Um, and, and of course, what, what Max had figured out was that there was still broad surveillance taking place and it was taking place of many officials here in Europe. And understandably, US allies began to ask the question, well, why are you using these broad national security authorities against the leaders of, of your closest allies? And uh, frankly, uh, President Obama had a problem because he needed to be able to explain to Chancellor Merkel why it was the case that the US spy agencies were listening to her private communications. And so there was an effort to establish uh, a new basis for the transfer of uh, data on Europeans to the United States, largely for commercial purposes, because people like using these internet services. And that's where Safe Harbor uh, came from. Uh, but, but Max, in his first challenge to Safe Harbor, said this may be a legal arrangement, but it's not an adequate legal arrangement when viewed through the lens of the rights that have been established in Europe uh, under the Data Protection Directive, which preceded the GDPR, and also under the Charter of Fundamental Rights, Articles uh, 7 and 8. And the Court of Justice agreed with Max, which is why the uh, Safe Harbor uh, arrangement, the original agreement, Act 1, as Christine said, Act 1 uh, did not succeed. Uh, and I went back before Congress, I testified again, and I explained to Congress what the consequence was of this decision. Essentially, it had a commercial impact because now US companies could not obtain the data of Europeans, and this would be a problem. But I also said at the end of the day, I urged Congress to strengthen US privacy law, not simply for commercial relations with the EU, but also to protect the rights of American citizens, which I think is still fundamental and still important. We don't have a federal data protection agency in the United States, as just about every democratic nation does. We don't have a comprehensive uh, federal privacy law as just about every democratic nation does. So these are shortcomings in, in our own system and they need uh, to be protected and, and addressed. So, okay, they, they go back to the drawing board. We're on to uh, Act Two, and that's where we get uh, Safe Harbor from, uh, which is, uh, I think as Christine said, I mean, basically the same ingredients of the same menu, and we get roughly the same courses. And Max goes back to the Court of Justice of the European Union and says this is also not sufficient and the Court of Justice agrees. Which is how we got to the present moment, which is the EU uh, data privacy framework. Now there has been already, um, you know, Florence's uh, presentation I thought was very good and very detailed. So I'm not going to go back through it, but now I'm going to answer your questions. I'm going to answer your questions, first of all, to give my assessment of what I think the outcome will be, and secondly, where I see the relationship to artificial intelligence. So here is my assessment. In Schrems II, the Court of Justice expressed two concerns. One, that this was not necessary and proportionate, which is a reference to Article 52 in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and also that the redress mechanism, the court was not a real court, it was an ombudsperson. And this is a reference to Article 47. I think this executive order adequately addresses the necessary and proportionate argument. I think a lot of progress has been made, and I will credit the Biden White House to, first of all, literally incorporate the language to describe US surveillance as it might be described in Europe in terms of the use of necessary and proportionate authorities, but also more precisely to draw some very clear lines uh, 
about what type of information may be collected and what type of information may not be collected, and even to acknowledge, I think, on the very first page, that all people are entitled to a fundamental right of privacy and dignity. So this executive order does not draw the sharp distinction, at least at the outset, between U.S. persons and non-U.S. persons that the U.S. has done in the past. So to me, this is, this is a success. But I will say frankly that I do not think if the Court of Justice looks closely, it will be persuaded that the Data Protection Court of Review satisfies Article 47. And the reason, uh, it was actually a very good slide that, that Christine put up, but you know, I don't wanna say this is a court in name only, that would be a little unfair, and there are truly very distinguished people who have been placed on this court, but it has very limited authorities. It's a discretionary authority. The type of remedies it provides, I think they use the phrase appropriate remediation, struck me as quite minimal. And no one is going to be entitled to any damages or any compensation for a harm that has occurred, which we would think of as central to an effective form of uh, judicial redress. It just doesn't exist in the structure of the Data Protection Review Court. Now I offer this criticism also with a great deal of sympathy because I know how hard the US Justice Department and how hard the White House worked to construct a strong executive order. But there only, there's only so much in the US system that the president can do because you see ultimately, and this is the historic irony that Congress understands, ultimately it's for Congress to decide what the scope of surveillance authority should be. And that of course takes us back to section 702 because if you want a robust mechanism to limit the surveillance of non-US persons, then you have to either repeal section 702, which establishes the legal authority, or you have to severely narrow it to make sure that it's aligned with the type of judicial oversight that we would otherwise anticipate. One more point on 702, there's quite a debate raging right now in the US Congress about whether in fact to limit it and reform it or whether unfortunately to actually expand it ironically again in a way that will be used against people in the United States who are not US citizens but are seeking asylum or visa. So we have a strong anti-immigration constituency in the US Congress, and they would like to use the Section 02 surveillance database to go through the communications of people in the United States who are seeking asylum or seeking visas, review their private communications, and then make those determinations based on whatever they obtain, which I think would be, would be terrible. Okay, so my final point on artificial intelligence. When we think about how the Court of Justice considers the data protection, uh, data privacy framework, I would like to propose to you that time did not stop in 2020. Even though everyone was quite concerned about what would be required to satisfy the judgment in Schrems II, there have been dozens of opinions regarding data protection issued since the Schrems decision. And to me, by far the most interesting decision is a decision from the court last summer. I'm gonna try the French, Ligue des Droits Humains, the French human rights organization that brought the challenge to the passenger name record uh, directive, which is a broad surveillance authority. Now, I'm not gonna tell you the summary of the case other than to say, the Court of Justice basically said it was okay to do this type of surveillance and to profile travelers, but the key requirement was that it was based on a human determination. And the court goes out of its way to say that if machine learning techniques had been used to develop the search criteria, it would not be permissible because according to the Court of Justice, machine learning techniques for the purpose of surveillance are incompatible with the protection of fundamental rights. And to me, the very interesting question that looms in the background of a review 
of this surveillance authority in the year 2024 is the extent to which machine learning techniques are being used by intelligence agencies to determine the scope of surveillance. Because if in fact that is occurring, then we've now opened a new chapter and raised a new set of issues that need to be addressed as we understand uh, transborder data flow. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, this is fascinating.